Hey everybody, it's Mr. Hatfield. Hope you're all doing great. I can't wait to read your emails, find out what you've been up to. I haven't been up to much myself. Probably similar to you guys, watching some videos, playing some video games, but still keeping busy, right? Going for walks, reading, trying to do things that you didn't have time to do before. Uh, I want to read this novel Peak with you guys, and after each chapter, I will talk about some things that the author is doing, and hopefully we can use this book to improve our own writing and our own understanding of uh, stories. And I'll give you some writing activities that will help us practice that. So we're going to read Peak by Roland Smith. There's the contents. Oh, there's the path from Everest Base Camp to the mountain. Moleskin number one. So chapter one's called The Assignment. My name is Peak. Yeah, I know. Weird name. But you don't get to pick your name or your parents. Or a lot of other things in life for that matter. It could have been worse. My parents could have been could have named me Glacier or Abyss or Crampon. I'm not kidding. According to my mom, all those names were on the list. Vincent, my literary mentor at your school, this would be your English teacher, asked me to write this for my year-end assignment. There's no grades at my school. When Vincent reads the sentence, you just read, you just read, he'll say, peak, that is a run-on sentence and chaotically parenthetical. That's how he talks. Meaning it's a little confusing and choppy. And I'll tell him that my life is parenthetical, and the chaos is due to the fact that I'm starting this assignment in the back of a Toyota pickup in Tibet, aka China, with an automatic pencil that doesn't have an eraser, and it's not likely I'm going to find an eraser around here. Vincent has also said that a good writer should draw the reader in by starting in the middle of the story with a hook, and then go back and fill in what happened before the hook. Once you have the reader hooked, you can write whatever you want as you slowly reel them in. I guess Vincent thinks readers are fish. If that's the case, most of Vincent's fish have gotten away. He's written something like 20 literary novels, all of which are out of print. If he knew what he was talking about, why do I have to search the dark, moldering aisles of used bookstores to find his books? Now I've done it, but remember this. Vincent, writers should tell the brutal tr truth of their own vo in their own voice and not let individual, society, or consequences dictate their words. And you thought no one was listening to you in class. <laughs> you also know that I really like your books, or I wouldn't waste my time trying to find them. Nor would I be trying to get this story down on the back of a truck in Tibet. Speaking of which, this morning we slowed down to get around a boulder the size of a school bus that had fallen in the middle of the road. In the USA, we would use dynamite or heavy equipment to move it. In Tibet, they used picks, sledgehammers, and prisoners in tattered, quilted coats to chip the boulder down to nothing. The prisoners smiled at us as we tried to run over their shackled feet in the narrow road, or tried to not run over. Their cheerful faces were covered in nicks and cuts from rock shrapnel. Those not chipped used crude, not chipping, used crude wooden wheelbarrows to move the man-made gravel over the potholes, where very old Tibetan cr prisoners used battered shovels and rakes to fill in the holes. Chinese soldiers in green uniforms and with rifles slung over their shoulders stood around 50-gallon burn barrels smoking cigarettes. The prisoners looked happier than the soldiers did. I wondered if the boulder would be gone by the time I came back through. I wondered if I'd ever come back. That's the end of chapter one. Chapter two, The Hook. I was only two-thirds up the wall when the sleet started to freeze onto the black terracotta. Terracotta is like clay. My fingers were numb. My nose was running. I didn't have a free hand to wipe my nose, or enough rope to rappel about 500 feet to the ground. 
I had planned everything out so carefully, except for the weather, and now it was uh uh-oh time. A gust of wind tried to peel me off the wall. I dug my fingers into the seam and hugged the terracotta until it passed. I should have waited until June to make the ascent. But no, moron has to go up in March. Why? Because everything was ready and I have a problem with waiting. I had studied the wall, built all my custom protection, and picked the date. I was ready. And if the date passed, I might not try it at all. It doesn't take much to talk yourself out of a stunt like this. That's why there are over 6 billion people sitting safely inside homes. And one moron, I shouted. Option number one. Could finish the climb 264 feet up, or about 100 precarious finger holds, providing my fingers didn't break off like icicles. Option number two. I could climb down. A little over 500 feet, 250 finger holds. Option three, wait to be rescued. Scratch that option. No one knew I was even on this wall. By morning, providing someone actually looked up and saw me, I would be an icy gargoyle. And if I lived, my mom would drop me off the wall herself. Up it is then. I timed my moves between vicious blasts of wind, which were becoming more frequent the higher I climbed. The sleet turned to hail, pelting me like a swarm of frozen hornets. But the worst happened about 30 feet from the top, 15 measly finger holds away. I had stopped to give the lactic acid searing my shoulders and arms a chance to simmer down. I was mouth-breathing, partly from exertion, partly from terror, and I told myself I would make the final push as soon as I caught my breath. While I waited, a thick mist drifted in around me. The top of the wall disappeared, which was just as well. When you're tired and scared, 30 feet looks about the length of two football fields, and that can be pretty demoralizing. Scaling a wall happens one foothold and one handhold at a time. Thinking beyond that can weaken your resolve. And it's your will that gets you to the top as much as your muscles and climbing skills. Finally, I started breathing through my runny nose again. Kind of snorting, really. But I was able to close my mouth over every breath. This is it, I told myself. Fifteen more handholds, and I've topped it. I reached up for the next seam and encountered a little snag. Well, a big snag, really. My right ear and cheek were frozen to the wall. To reach the top, you must have resolve, muscles, skill, and a face. Mine was anchored to the wall like a bolt, and a portion of it stayed there, when I gathered enough resolve to tear it loose. Now I was mad, which was exactly what I needed to finish the climb. Cursing with every vertical lunge, I stopped about four feet below the edge, tempted to tag this monster with the blood running down my neck. But instead, I took the mountain stencil out of my pack. Cheating, I know, but you have to have two free hands to do it freehand slapped it on the wall, and filled it with blue spray paint. So guys, a stencil is like a big piece of paper with a design cut out, and then you can spray paint over it, and it'll make that design on a wall. So he's kind of, he's, he's graffitiing the wall. This is when the helicopter came up behind me and nearly blew me off the wall. You're under arrest, an amplified voice shouted above the deafening rotors. I looked up. Most of the mist had been swirled away by the chopper rotors, and for the first time in an hour, I could see the busy street 800 feet below the skyscraper. So he was climbing a skyscraper. A black rope dropped down next to me, and two alarmed and hungry faces leaned over the edge of the roof. Take the rope! 
I wasn't about to take the rope four feet away from my goal. I started up. Take the rope! When the head reached the top, when my head reached the top of the railing, they hauled me up and cuffed my wrists behind my back. They were wearing SWAT gear and NYPD baseball caps. And there were a lot of them. One of the cops leaned close to my bloody ear. What were you thinking? He said, then jerked me to my feet and handed me off to a regular street cop. Get this moron to emergency. So that's the end of chapter two. So in these chapters, we're going to start here. Chapter one, we learn a lot of exposition. So exposition is how uh, an author will just set up a story. These first chapters are all exposition. They're telling us about the characters and the setting. So they're telling us about the characters at the start. We learn, it starts with, my name is Peak. So we learn this boy, he's got an unusual name, his name is Peak. He, we learn that he's a boy and he's in school. He has a teacher named Vincent. And we learn about the character's personality, even in this first chapter. For me, I think Peak's a funny character. He's like, I know, it's a weird name. It says on page 10, the first page, just in this book. And he says, I guess Vincent thinks readers are like fish. So he's making fun of his teacher. So we get this sense that, yeah, he's like a, a funny, clever kind of character. Uh, I also get the sense that he's pretty respectful. He says on page 11, you also know that when I really, that I really like your books or I wouldn't waste my time trying to find them. So he's telling his teacher that he really likes his teacher's books and his teacher's writing. That shows me, uh, even though he can be like a, a smart aleck, he's still a very respectful boy. For the setting, setting means where and when. In this story, we learn at the start, he's in Tibet. Tibet is a country kind of a part of China. Uh, you can find it kind of divides where uh, it's between Mount Everest and China. And it's, it's a country that kind of wants to be independent from China, but that's why there were Chinese soldiers, right? Because China has control of this country. And they were driving down a mountain. You can, uh, they introduced some cultural differences, like they're clearing roads, the prisoners are in public. So instead of clearing roads with dynamite and stuff like we would here in Canada or America, uh, they had prisoners in public, and they were making the prisoners just use pickaxes and sledgehammers to clean the roads. And then they note that the prisoners maybe looked happier than the soldiers did. It's pretty interesting. In chapter two, that was called the hook. And a hook is something that we do in our writing. A hook makes the reader interested in your story. You want your story to start with a hook. A hook could even just be one sentence, right? It could be like a fact or a question or just anything that when you read it, you're like, oh, that's cool. I want to read more. I'm interested in figuring out what comes next. So I think the, the whole point of this chapter, chapter two, is to hook us, make us interested in this story, right? And it does a good job. It starts with he's already halfway climbing up this skyscraper. There's like a snowstorm going on while he's climbing up the skyscraper. We, it's, it's crazy. We learn some stuff about Peak's character as well, right? The character traits means the same thing as personality, pretty much. So some of Peak's personality or character that we learn in this, uh, we learn that he's impatient. So he had all this planning, which was really smart, and I guess that's another personality too. He is planned. He's a smart boy. He does all this planning, but he doesn't want to wait for when the weather will be better. So he climbs when it's cold. He's pretty reckless. He didn't have rope in case something went wrong or have enough rope. Uh, but I'd say he's also brave. He doesn't uh, doesn't turn back even when he's halfway there. And he, rather than like giving up because his face is frozen to the wall, he uh, pulls his frozen ear from the wall. So that's about it for these two chapters, guys. Uh, there are instructions in either the email or on Teams. Uh, continue with what you're doing. Can't wait to read your emails and get back to you next week. Uh, I will also have chapter three posted for this week. I think it's scheduled for Thursday. And then after that, I'm going to get you to write me a, just a little something about the story, what you think so far. All right. Have a great day, everybody.